Hi, welcome to another episode of Talking with Docs. I'm Dr. Brad Winning. And I'm Dr. Paul Zalzo. I'm Dr. Mike Heffernan. There you go, Dr. Heffernan, cardiologist, is back with us to discuss all the cardiology topics that you guys have asked us about. And one of the most topical ones um, in the last month or so has been DeMar Hamlin, Buffalo Bills uh, safety, who obviously tragically had an arrest on the field. Um, but cardiac not, arrest. Cardiac arrest, yes, yeah, sorry, cardiac arrest. <laughs> be clear about that. Yeah, cardiac arrest. Uh, on the field, but thankfully he's doing very, very well. Actually attended their playoff loss this past weekend. We're gonna talk a little bit about what happened and why it's important for people to know the details of this. So, fire away, Mike. Sure. Um, so, what happened? Yeah, so what happened? So let's start with cardiac arrest. Yeah, um, what is it? Cardiac arrest doesn't equal heart attack. Okay. That, that's, a, that's the first thing that uh, people were talking about. Um, you can have a cardiac arrest for a variety of reasons. Essentially what that means is that for whatever reason, at that point in time, the heart is not pumping enough blood to get out to feed the rest of your body, your brain, you'll collapse. Um, and it's usually as a result of fatal rhythm. And then the issue is, you know, so what caused that fatal rhythm? Now, most cardiac arrests occur as a result of a heart attack. Right. So heart attacks, right. um, you know, they come out of the blue for some people and, um, and can cause um, a fatal rhythm. And a third of people or so who will have a heart attack actually can have a cardiac arrest and never make it to hospital. Wow. Okay. That's not what happened to DeMar Hamlin. Okay. So DeMar Hamlin had, uh, it was just a perfect storm. You and I were talking about this just a what little bit earlier. What do we call it? So this is called commotio cordis. Mm. Now, I'm not DeMar Hamlin's physician, right? right? Mm. So, uh, and I wasn't involved in his care. A little bit of speculation, but. Absolutely. Um, so most likely event was commotio cordis. Um, and so what is commotio cordis? Yeah, what is commotio cordis? So, I like the name. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. yeah. So it is, it is a, a trauma or blow right over the heart in a very, very small or well-localized space. It has to have enough force. Mm -hmm. um, they say about 60 kilometers an hour, probably wow. 40 miles an hour uh, for the other viewers who are using the old imperial system. Mm -hmm. um, and so, so it has to be a force over the heart, a sufficient force, and it has to be right at the right time of the cardiac cycle. Right. And so what does that mean? So, you know, you've all seen those squiggly lines, uh, which is your ECG. Mm -hmm. So, you know, there's the, uh, there's the first squiggle, which means the atria is contracted. The second big peak means that the ventricle has pumped enough blood out to feed your body. And then the final squiggle in all of that is the heart resetting for the next beat. We'll put up a little image and put a little arrow to the time and the cycle that was the so problem. The, the P, so, the QRS complex, and the T wave. And, the T. and, so, and so where in that is the key moment? So the T wave. So right. the T wave is when the heart is, is repolarizing, getting ready for the next beat. It's relaxing, mm -hmm. it's resting, it's mm -hmm. getting all set. If you get a blow right in the middle of the T wave when everything's being relaxed, mm -hmm. it all of a sudden kind of creates mayhem. Okay. And that can cause ventricular fibrillation. And so people would wonder, football games, there's thousands of tackles yeah. over the years, so it's the perfect amount of force in the perfect spot on your body at the perfectly the time. wrong time in your cycle. In your cardiac cycle. And right. that's why it's a, it's a rare so rare. It's rare. Yeah. And so, you know, we talk in cardiology about sudden death in athletes. Um, commotion cordis would be considered kind of number two or number three right. in terms of the risk, but also recognizing these are rare events. Right. You know, we're talking about DeMar Hamlin because it ha it's a rare event, but it happened in front of millions of people. Right. Yeah. Um, so it got people talking, which yeah. is good. Yep. You can have the discussion. Um, can happen in hockey. Right. Uh, you know, we've seen, I think it was, uh, was Probert uh, got right. hit with a yep. puck uh, mm -hmm. several years ago. Right. Uh, happens during baseball. So again, small ball, pitcher firing in at the batter, um, happens to hit you at the wrong place at the wrong time. Right. Um, yeah. So, so then, so he's on the ground. He's so on the ground. can we talk a little bit about the excellent job that was done by the team and a lot of stuff because the team was around him, yeah. the medical staff, what did they do to save his life essentially? Yeah, yeah. what are the key features uh, of saving someone's life yeah. in so this setting? It was fantastic. So he got CPR almost immediately. Okay. It was a Buffalo Bills trainer yeah. uh, who did the CPR. Uh, best uh, evidence that we seem to have is he had CPR for about nine minutes. Wow. So wow. good CPR for a good period of time. 
Um, also, there are reports that he was definitely defibrillated. So okay. they did see this ventricular fibrillation, uh, this abnormal and fatal heart rhythm. So he's defibrillated, he has CPR, um, and then uh, the paramedics would have come out then and also put uh, a tube down his throat. Right. Um, and uh, to, so that you know, breathing is not going to be something DeMar Hamlin was going to be able to do. And so essentially we have to help and breathe for you. Right. Um, so reset your heart, breathe for you. And then there's a whole series of events that happen afterwards okay. to provide a good outcome. Okay, okay, so the key is if this happens somewhere, if someone's in cardiac arrest, of course the first thing you do is phone 911. 911 is the most important thing. Yep. In this case, probably they got a million 911 calls yeah. from the yeah. audience. Uh, and then C CPR is initiated right away and a possibly and likely a defibrillator. Interestingly enough, after that event, a local baseball club called me up and said, hey, can you help us out and find out where we can get the best defibrillator? Yep. Uh, and then you reached out to me. And then I reached out to you and said, yeah, sure, no problem. <clears throat> Mike, yep. where can I get the best defibrillator? Yeah. So those are the key features. But of course, at home, 911 is the most important thing to do. One of the quick side notes is this is why it's important that everyone has CPR training. The trend has changed to be about 30 compressions per minute. We talked about this. So, so about 100 compressions, so 100 per, compressions minute. per minute. Yeah. Using the song, Staying Alive is about the beat that they use. The breathing, a lot of people are uncomfortable with the breathing, so yeah. if you're not comfortable, then just do the compressions. Do this the has compressions. significant benefit. Yeah, if, uh, you know, if, you're, if you're comfortable doing the breathing, right. do 30 compressions. That's where the 30 That's compressions come in. Do 30 compressions, give a couple of breaths right. back to your 30 compressions. But you want 100, 120 compressions in a minute. So, right. And it's vigorous. It's not TV, not yeah. TV compressions. Right. It's not mm. the this. Mm -hmm. You know, it's two inches down. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And that, and that happens because we have flexible rib cages, there's cartilage that connects it. It does have the ability to expand and contract. That's how we breathe. So you don't have to worry about hurting the person, you're saving their life. Right. Okay. Well, so um, after that, stabilized, stab not even stabilized, but they've got hopefully got a resuscitated. They have yeah. a rhythm, yeah. I guess, from the uh, defibrillation. Ambulance comes. Ambulance comes, take them off to the nearest center. So nearest center, which is gonna be able to provide the care that is required in this situation. Right. Um, and so then it, it's a team then. Um, so we have this happening right down the hallway here in our intensive care unit. We probably have a couple of cardiac arrests like this a week. Yep. Mm -hmm. um, and so it involves the intensivists. So they're in, they're intense. Mm -hmm. um, so they're they're physicians who just uh, their specialty is intensive care, um, expertise in nursing care, physiotherapists, respiratory therapists, pharmacists, nutrition. Like it's amazing the team that kind of comes together to make this happen. Um, the principles are to to paralyze the patient. So we. We mm -hmm. actually give a medication to paralyze them so we stop all their work. Right. They're put on the life support machine or the ventilator, so we do the breathing for them. Right. Um, and, then, and then for a long time, cooling was thought to be really important. Right. Um, we've gone through a bit of a, a mind shift in terms of cooling. We definitely used to cool down to 32 degrees Celsius. Our bodies sit at 37. Mm -hmm. um, 32 is pretty cold. Yeah. Um, we don't do that now. Uh, so some centers like ours stay at 35. Um, some centers say, look, cooling is not that important. Let's, let's just make sure they don't have fevers. So there's a variety of things that we do, but, but cooling for a lot of centers is, is still in the game. So paralysis, ventilator, cooling, and then you wait for 24 hours. And your goal is just you're reducing the metabolic load on your body, essentially yeah. saying, take a nap. We'll talk to you after you wake yeah. up from your nap. We're going to give you a 24-hour nap. Yeah. And then you shut things off yeah. after 24 hours. If you've cooled them, you warm them. Yeah. If you've paralyzed them, well, you've always paralyzed them. Um, you stop that. You let them come out of their sedation. And then everyone, really, they are, we're all crossing our fingers. Because, sure. you know, we know we've done a good job with, the, you know, we know that the rhythm is normal. Right. We've done an ultrasound of the heart by that time point. So we know what the heart functions like. And right. most often it's actually not bad. That it's actually moving rather than it's moving, moving regularly. And it's not dead, you yep. know. Um, but, but what we don't know is what's happened up here. Right. And uh, that's what it, the watch away Okay, is. so then any neurologic compromise that may have occurred because the brain was not being perfused, not getting enough blood supply during the event and in the time around the event. Right. Okay, so that's an important, that's one of the most important things you try and determine yeah. after one of these events. It's the wild card. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. okay. And the induced paralysis, you, you may, viewers may have heard that as when you hear someone's in a drug induced coma, sort of right. thing, you hear it on the street, that sort of it sounds a little more dramatic that it does. way, doesn't it? The coma it? sounds dramatic. Dra yeah. Drama, you know. 
Okay, so thankfully, he essentially had an early stages full recovery. He did. Yeah. What, is the, what does the future look like for him? Because I'm sure a lot of people are wondering, does this guy ever play again? You know, does he have chronic cardiac care? Is he going to have a yep. chronic heart problem? Yeah, so the answer is he should probably play again. I'm not, I'm not his physician, sure, just to be clear. Course, of course. Um, mm-hmm. Don't work for the Buffalo Bills. Sure. Mm-hmm. Um, but so Kamosha Cordes was just... A, he, he's a, in a, your I'm, fantasy draft, though. He's in my fantasy that. draft. So that's kind of a bit yeah. of a conflict of interest. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so he, he, you know, it was an unlucky event. Right. So, but what they are looking for in DeMar Hamlin is to make sure that he didn't have something else that predisposed to Like it. a trigger of his rhythm. Absolutely. Mm-hmm. So the most common cause of sudden death in an athlete is something called hypertrophic cardiomyopathy. Hokum. Hokum. Yeah. So we can do that in a different episode. Mm-hmm. Um, but that is a genetic disorder. It is an enlarged piece of muscle in the heart that can predispose to sudden death, particularly in athletes. And undiagnosed usually until that event Absolutely. Yeah. I think there's so, been some famous basketball players, young, first yep. round draft picks kind of thing that go and it's all of a sudden, what the heck happened? Yeah. Mm-hmm. And there are some countries in the world that actually, that mandate screening for oh. Hokum okay. before uh, uh, you know, um, competitive events. Oh, wow. Um, and some professional sports do uh, as well. So, um, yeah, so they'll look for things like that. They'll right. check his coronary arteries, they'll do some other testing. But ultimately, if and if and when they shouldn't find anything, commotio cordis will be the firm diagnosis. Diagnosis of exclusion. Then. Yeah. Well, what's great is that a lot of really positive things can come out of this, not yeah. to mention his foundation, who yeah. has, I think, $10 million or something for kids in his local neighborhood. So it is amazing. So now, take this home with you. Learn CPR. Yeah. Be aware if you're in a facility where the, the defibrillators are. And if you're participating in one that doesn't have one, maybe talk to someone about considering getting one to save events like this. And you might think that they're a crazy price. Yeah. Um, now, they're not cheap, to be, to be mm-hmm. fair. Yes. Yeah. Um, but they're about, uh, you know, $1,500 Canadian, about $1,000 American. Yep. Um, but when people pool their money together, charity yep. au- auctions and yep. drives, that sort of thing, you can kind of raise some funds to try and get it in your community centers. And the other important thing about them is you don't need to be an intensivist to know how to use one. A lot of no. them are quite automatic. Yeah. Uh, once you put the leads on or even one lead on, it makes the diagnosis and then administers the appropriate electrical Yeah, you don't even have to make the decision to nope. do it, right? No, It'll a do lot it of them are you. quite automatic. So they are handy uh, to have around. Amazing. Amazing. Thanks so much to Dr. Heffernan for explaining this for us. And if you like this video, please like it, subscribe to our channel. And remember, you are in charge of your own health. Go learn some CPR. We'll see you next time.